And today we'll talk about translations of the graphs of sine and cosine functions. So we talked about two important aspects of the graphs, which was the, the period and the amplitude. Now we're going to talk about um, horizontal translations and vertical translations. So taking the graph and moving it left or right, moving it up or down, and what that looks like on the, the actual you know, function for the graph when we talk about it. And then we'll combine those two together and possibly look at a trigonometric model at the end if we have some time and if it's worth it. All right. Uh, so first things first, horizontal translations. The graph of any function, but specifically a sine or cosine function is what we're going to be talking about right now. Um, y equals f of x minus d is translated horizontally, so left or right compared to the original graph y equals f of x. So we're given y equals f of x is that, you know, cubic function or really kind of like a tangent function we'll talk about later on. If I have y equals f of x minus 4, it's going to move 4 units to the right. If I have y equals f of x plus 3, it's going to move 3 units to the left. The way that works is because it looks weird when we talk about this, but we have to remember that we're talking about a function f of x minus d. Because in that case, if d is positive, if I have x minus 4, then I'm going to move d units in a positive direction. Looks weird because it's, you know, still it's going to say x minus 4 in the function, but we're going to move to the right because the, the convention that we have is that it's a function of x minus d. So x minus 4, x minus 2, x minus 1, whatever it is, moves it to the right. And if d is negative, so if I have x plus 3, or really x minus negative 3 in that case, then it's going to move to the left because that d value is negative. It's going to move absolute value of d to the left instead. All right? Important to remember, again, because it's not intuitive when we see this in a function, when it actually appears in a function, not intuitive to remember that, all right, if I see it as a minus, it's going to move to the right because we would normally assume it's going to go negatively. Um, but remember, if it's a minus 4, minus 10, whatever, that's a positive D because we're assuming our convention is X minus D there. All right. So... That is what's going to be known. I'll probably interchange these a lot, but um, a horizontal shift or a horizontal translation is known as a phase shift when we talk about sine and cosine functions. And that X minus D part is what's called the argument. Probably won't use that very often. Um, but if you see phase shift, again, that means we're moving a sine or cosine function left or right. It's a horizontal translation. So on the X axis. All right, just interchangeable definitions. Let's see how this is actually going to work. If I want to graph the function y equals sine of x minus pi over 3 over a single period. <clears throat> there are a couple of different ways that we can do this. First one is to do it exactly the same way, really, that we've been doing the other problems that we had, the ones that we had in 4.1. So... I can find just one period. I know that sine or cosine always has a period over zero to two pi. If I want to adjust that for what's given in this problem, I'm just gonna take whatever's inside of the sine function. We did this with um, you know, the period itself. We kind of we uh, rearranged stuff that way. But I'm gonna take whatever's inside of the, the sine function, the x minus pi over three, in this case, and I'm going to put it between 0 and 2 pi, right? Because that's where sine normally goes. And then this is going to tell us where the new period, where it's going to start and end when we talk about a single period of sine for this particular function. So take x minus pi over 3, make it greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 2 pi. Again, that's a single period of sine or cosine. All right, and then I'm going to add pi over 3 to each term so that I can just solve for x in the middle. So if I add pi over 3 to 0, it's just pi over 3. If I add pi over 3 to 2 pi, which is 6 pi over 3, I get 7 pi over 3. All right. 
And then once I found that, again, if we did this with a period, like if I had y equals sine of 4x, after I found this interval, the next thing we did was what? Plug it in. Uh, plug in after I had to do, had to plug in to what? We are going to plug in on the table. What do I need to do in that intervening step so I know what values I'm plugging in for? <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to divide it up into four different intervals. All right, so I need to find those. <clears throat> need to find those middle parts a little bit different this time than what we had before since we're not starting at zero and then just multiplying each number by one fourth or one half whatever it is so if I find this, if I start with pi over three I still know the total distance the way that we'll go about doing this all right and this will go especially for later on when we also change the actual length of the period of these functions is I'm going to take the total difference between the left and right endpoints. So seven pi over three minus pi over three. I mean, all we did was add pi over three. I know that's gonna be two pi, but take this right endpoint minus the left endpoint, get the total length of the period that we're talking about. All right, if it's two pi, then that means if I'm going to divide that total distance up into four parts, I'm gonna multiply that by one fourth. So one fourth times two pi is Uh, yeah, one half pi. So I end up with pi over two. So that's going to be the distance from my endpoint to the next part of the interval to the next one to the next one to the end. I'm going to take that total length of the interval, multiply it by one fourth. I'm dividing by one fourth there. So now if I know that two pi times one fourth is pi over two, I'm going to take pi over three, this left endpoint, and add pi over two to that. Well, I have to change the, the denominator there, but pi over three is the same as two pi over six. Pi over two is the same as three pi over six. So two pi plus three pi over six gives me a five pi over six. And then add pi over two again and again and again. I'm just gonna keep adding that same exact value every time once I know what the, the interval is split up into. All right, might be a little bit more complicated with these. In fact, probably will be because we're not dealing with uh, you know, a number as nice as zero to begin with for our left endpoint, but we're still doing it essentially the same way. Find out what the the length of each of those individual parts we're splitting it up into is, and just keep adding them to that left endpoint where we start. All right, so I get pi over three, five pi over six, four pi over three, 11 pi over six, seven pi over three, once they're simplified. And then I can just plug those in, just like we did before into a table. I'm going to have x is equal to each of those values, and then I'm going to find x minus pi over 3. All right, figure out, just like we had, if I had 4x inside of there, I multiplied the x by 4. And just like before, when I do that, I end up with those quadratical angles, the 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi. And as we should, it's the reason we're doing that again, dividing it up that way. So when I do that, <clears throat> makes it easier to find sine of zero, sine of pi over two, sine of pi, and so on from there. It gives us these easy values to deal with. All right, so plugging them in exactly like before, I just have to make sure I find the correct intervals, the correct points where I'm going to be plugging those in for. All right, and then I'm just gonna graph those X coordinates and these Y coordinates just gonna have a an amplitude of one and a period of two pi. So it looks like this, all right? Pi over three was the first point. Sine of that function was equal to zero there. Pi, five pi over six was the next one, was equal to one, and so on. It gives me those, again, those points where I have a maximum or a minimum or an intercept on that x axis, all right? makes sense there. Same idea as before. The only the only big difference, we're kind of changing the way that we go about figuring out that interval. The only big difference there, uh -oh. there it is. Oh, I ran out of batteries here. Only big difference is going to be to use that 
pi or x minus pi over three in between zero to two pi and then solve for x there. All right. The other way that we can go about doing this, which makes more sense given what we, we said at the beginning and how something shifts, is I know that now x minus pi over three means I'm going to have a shift to the right since it's always x minus d, that means d is positive for this one. d is a positive pi over three. So I'm just gonna take the original graph of y equals sine of x, graph that like I normally would, starts at zero, it's one at pi over two, it's zero at pi, negative one at three pi over two, and then zero again at two pi. Take every one of those points and just shift it pi over three units to the right. So if I know at zero, it's equal to zero, well, then my new graph is gonna be zero at pi over three. If I know at pi over two, it's equal to one, add pi over three to that to get five pi over six, that's where the new graph is equal to one. All right, I'm just gonna take each of those points, the, those easy points for us to graph originally, and then just shift them to the right pi over three. So if we know what the graph of y equals sine of x is, sine of x minus pi over three is just all of those particular values that we're used to, shifted pi over three units to the right. All right, makes sense. Can do it either way. Again, it's not gonna, I don't think it's gonna ask you for any particular way of doing it on my lab. And I, I certainly, it doesn't matter as long as you're getting it to the right spot. Uh, but either way works. <laughs> the first one, I, this one's probably easier for something simple like this. First one's probably a better way when we get into some more complicated stuff and we'll kind of see why that is in just a second. All right, let's say I wanna graph y equals three cosine of x plus pi over four over one period. So it's gonna be shifted to the left in this case because I have Really, I have x minus a negative pi over four. So my d, the shift that we have there is gonna be negative. Has an amplitude of three and it's a cosine function. I know where it's gonna start and end. I could graph it that way. So if we go by the first method, remember, I'm gonna take that x plus pi over four, set it between zero and two pi because cosine again, has a, a period of two pi, subtract pi over four from both sides, I end up with negative pi over four to seven pi over four there. Divide that up into four parts. Again, I know it's still from zero to two pi, so I'm gonna add pi over two, three times, technically four times to get to the end. If I divide it up into four parts, negative pi over four, pi over four, three pi over four. 5 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4, all right? So the same values, I mean, so when we're adding the pi 4 to the 2 pi, I have to get the same column there to add that. That's same, uh, same yeah, that'd be the, the same best way. Yeah. Okay. All right. That gives me it split up. And just like before, I can plug these in. Those are my x values. x plus pi over 4 gives me those quadrantal angles, 0 pi over 2 all the way up to 2 pi and then take cosine of those values, get our normal, you know, one, zero, negative one, zero, one. And then just don't forget that we had that coefficient out in front, that three, that gives our amplitude. So multiply by that to get our final Y coordinate for how we're gonna graph these. All right, as simple as plugging in. Again, I should always, this should probably be, I, I'm gonna keep emphasizing this, that second line, whenever we do that, whatever I'm plugging, whatever I'm, I'm doing inside of the sine or cosine function that I'm plugging in there should always result in those quadrantal angles. If it doesn't, and always check, don't just kind of assume it, always check. But if it doesn't, then we need to go back and fix something. All right, and then just plug those in to the graph, the X and Y coordinates. <clears throat> Notice it's shifted from a normal cosine a little bit to the left, as we assumed it would be, as an amplitude of three, as we saw also. All right, it's just finding those points. 
again, same way we've done before, just a little bit slight change when we started off before we divide it into four parts because I have to you know, either add or subtract whatever D is to zero or two pi to get that, All right? Second way, again, probably a little bit easier. If I were to graph just Y equals three cosine of X, what I have to remember is again, that shift because it's X plus pi over four is the same as minus negative pi over four. It's always X minus D. So in this case, D is negative pi over four, means I'm gonna to shift to the left. But if D is negative pi over four, I'm just, again, graphing Y equals three cosine of X. So on the Y axis, it starts at three because it's cosine instead of sine. It goes through pi over two where it's zero, at pi it's negative three, at three pi over two is zero, and then at two pi it's three. That's our original function. Take each of those points and just shift them pi over four units to the left. Just each of those, don't, you don't have to find any points in between or anything like that, but wherever we have a maximum or minimum or one of those intercepts, just move it to the left, in this case, pi over four units. All right. Makes sense. Pretty clear on that one. Make sure to graph it first with, with the amplitude. If you're doing one like this, make sure we're graphing y equals three cosine of x first so that I shift those points the correct way. All right. Questions on that part. All right. Complicated a little bit more. Let's say I want to graph y equals negative two cosine of 3x plus pi, right, over two periods. Not that it really matters. We just draw the second one to correspond to the first one. Right? This one gets more complicated. This is probably one where the first method is going to make the most sense and be the easiest and not result in us making a mistake that we could make the other way. But if I'm going to use method one to solve this, where I find the points and set them up, figure out what the X coordinate is, plug them into a table and get the values. All right. I'm going to take that 3X plus pi, set it between zero and two pi, because again, cosine's normal period is between zero and two pi. And then solve for X. So the first thing I would do is subtract pi from both sides or from all, all sides, I guess, all three parts. So I get negative pi less than or equal to 3x, less than or equal to pi, and then divide everything by three. So I'm gonna end up with negative pi over three, less than or equal to x, less than or equal to pi over three. All right. So just again, all we're doing is solving for x there, not a big deal, but put whatever's in parentheses, either for sine or cosine. Again, we'll have something different when we get to tangent tangent, all that kind of stuff. Um, for sine or cosine, put whatever's in parentheses, set that, again, greater than or equal to zero, less than or equal to two pi, our normal period of those functions. Split that up into four. Obviously, the total length, pi over three minus negative pi over three is two pi over three. So if I split that into four, if I multiply two pi over three by one fourth, I'm gonna have two pi over three times one fourth will be two pi over 12 or pi over six. So I'm gonna take negative pi over three and then plus pi over six and then plus another pi over six plus pi over six and then plus that again gives me the right input. So I end up with X coordinates of negative pi over three, negative pi over six, zero pi over six, and then that pi over three. And then this is already filling those in um, without the table, but just to kind of get through those steps. All right, gives me the coordinates to go through there. Notice negative two, zero, positive two, zero, negative two, sinusoidal curve, just like we're used to having. All right, but you can plug into the table and get those values. Just doesn't happen to be listed on this one. And then just plug those in. And that's gonna give us this looking curve, you know, from negative pi over three to pi over three. If I wanna graph that over two periods, generally we, 
we would go ahead and just take half a period on either side of that to kind of keep it symmetric on both sides. But if you just did a, another one there, that's two periods, that's what it looks like. All right. Makes sense. All right. Notice by shifting it pi units, well, it's not pi units. In fact, we're going to get into that. I'm not going to mention that. We'll talk about it some other time, I think a little further down the road. Um, the second method, right? I said this is probably the best way to do this, um, given that we have, you know, a, a BX plus D or, well, BX minus D in whatever the function is inside cosine or if it was sine. The reason for that is if I wanted to use the second method here, I have to be very, very careful. There's a hint already at the top on the title of this card where we're graphing y equals a cosine of, and then it has b times x minus d. All right. That's what it has to look like. So we get the appropriate period. So we get the appropriate phase shift whenever we're talking about this. So I have to put this in the form of a cosine of, and then a B value times in parentheses, X minus D. I have to make three X plus pi look like that. So in order to do that, I can, I'm gonna factor the three out of the X. I also have to factor the three out of the pi term. All right, and when I do that, I'm gonna end up with that negative two cosine and I'll have three times x plus pi over three in this case, all right? Notice if I multiply that three in, obviously I still get back to three x plus pi. We have to be very careful there because it's weird to think of factoring a three out of pi, but what we're doing is, is taking that out. All I, all I need to do is make sure I can rewrite it as whatever that b value is, whatever is being multiplied by x, I'm also gonna multiply by that d value. All right, this is the part, if you're gonna use this method that I would guarantee will cause the most problems and find the most mistakes on. Um, normally we would just assume, yeah, it just shifts pi units to the left. It doesn't shift pi units, shifts pi over three units. All right, and that's very, very important to check here. Does that make sense? So once we get that, again, it's, it's back to what we were doing before. I'm gonna find the amplitude is, well, the amplitude is two. So my A is, is negative two. B is three, so I'll get the period from that. And then D is negative pi over three. So I have a phase shift to the left of pi over three units. All right. That gives me again, amplitude of two. Period is two pi over B. So two pi over three in this case and the phase shift sends it pi over three units to the left, all right? Notice when we talk about this phase shift, the graph that I'm shifting to the left is gonna be the negative two cosine of three X, the part that doesn't have the plus or minus D there, all right? So if I graph this, the negative two cosine of three X, then I'm just gonna take every point that we have there, shift it a little bit. All right, this doesn't have a different graph for that because it's the same as this graph. But <clears throat> find the graph of y equals negative two cosine of three x. Again, that has a period of two pi over three. So that starts, we're gonna have two, or well, sorry, negative two would be where we start at. And then Pi over three will be a maximum. Two pi over three will be a minimum again. And then all of those points just shift over pi over three units to the left. All right. Have to be, again, if you're using this second method, it's the reason I kind of like the first one better, at least in this case, makes it a little bit clearer where everything's going. Um, make sure it's written in this form, a cosine or sine of B times X minus D in parentheses. Make sure we get the appropriate phase shift to go along with that. All right, questions on that? 
that's a phase shift or horizontal translation. Um, and then we'll get into the other type in just a second. We'll make sure we're here because the other one's a lot easier to deal with. Vertical translation is much simpler. We don't have to worry about anything. When we have a graph that's y equals c plus f of x or f of x and then plus c, doesn't matter where we write it. Um, it's vertically translated. If C is positive, it goes upwards. If C is negative, it goes downwards. All right. In this case, I don't have to worry about that C being um, the opposite of what we think. So before with that horizontal translation, we had X minus D. And if D was positive, it moved positively. D was negative. But it looked weird. In this case, if I have Y equals 1 plus F of X, it moves up 1. If I have y equals negative 3 plus f of x, it moves down 3. All right? And we just take every point that's on the graph that we know where it's at, move it those that particular number of units upwards or downwards. All right? So if I'm adding a value outside of the function, outside of sine or cosine in this case, because that's what we're talking about, that is going to be a vertical shift. If I'm adding or subtracting inside of the function, you know, plus pi or pi over three, whatever, that's a horizontal shift left or right. So let's say I want to graph y equals three minus two cosine of three x over two periods. It should look vaguely familiar because we just did this one except with a shift of, you know, pi over three units. But I also have that three out in front now. Again, I can do the same idea. If you want to make sure everything's working the same way, you don't have to do anything differently. You can always do this the exact same way every time. I can find, um, I can find in the first method the actual period of this graph. So I'm going to have two pi over b or two pi over three in this case split it up into four parts, 0, pi over 6, pi over 3, pi over 2, 2, pi over 3. All right, split it up into four parts that way. And then I'm just going to plug those in. All right, plug in those x values, those particular x values there, and then take cosine, well, take 3x so that I know I have 0, pi over 2, pi, 3, pi over 2, and 2, pi over 3. So kind of left out that usual second uh, second line, second row. But then cosine of each of those is gonna give me one at zero, negative one, zero and one again. Multiply by two and then take three minus that value. So three minus two is one, three minus zero is three. Three minus negative two is a positive five and then so on. All right. Just takes what we had a second ago without the phase shift and moves it up three units everywhere. I can graph that the exact same way, just using the X and Y coordinates, all right? All I'm doing, finding the period, right? Dividing it into four parts, plugging those values in until I get the value of the actual function and then just graph the X and Y coordinates there, all right? Notice this is going to have, um, anytime we have a, vertical shift like this, that middle line, instead of being, instead of being kind of, well, I shouldn't say symmetric, but instead of having, you know, the same amplitude above the x-axis and below the x-axis, now it's going to have the same amplitude, that middle line where it's going to go around, where it's going to have the intercepts and where I'll have the same value above and below it for a max and a min is going to be whatever C is. It's just going to be Y equals C. So in this case, that's y equals three. Um, and in another case we'll talk about, you know, could be negative one, could be positive five, whatever it is. All right. So that middle line is this value of C that we have there. It's just that horizontal line y equals C. Right? Simple enough plugging in. All right. Um, any questions on that? Because again, that was the simpler one. They kind of just go through that pretty quick. Questions on a vertical shift. Again, right here too, you could also just graph y equals negative two cosine of three x. 
when it's going to go through the points on the x-axis and then just move all of those up three units if it goes through negative one or if it goes through sorry negative two then it goes through one if it goes through zero now it goes through three if it goes through positive two now it goes through five we're moving everything up by three units there all right basic steps for going through all this right if we use the first method if i'm trying to graph um any any horizontal or vertical or combination of these translations first thing to do find an interval whose length is the the period of whatever the function is so 2 pi over b if we have a b value all right solve essentially and we can do this just by solving that zero less than or equal to b times x minus d less than or equal to two pi all right so i'm always going to plug again that comes down to whatever is inside of the sine or cosine function all right whatever whatever's in those parentheses so solve that divide that resulting interval into four equal parts as we've done before Evaluate the function at each of those x values that we get. Right? So they're still going to give us the maximums and the minimums and the intersection points. It just might happen that if we have a vertical translation, they intersect y equals c instead of the x-axis. All right. And then plot those points on a graph, draw a sinusoidal curve through them. All right. And if we need to draw more periods after that, just draw the same ones over and over again, right? Repeat in the same way. Not a lot different than the steps for before, all right? Where we found the period divided into four parts. Biggest difference, again, is just that very first part. We set the B times X minus D between zero and two pi, and then we solve it from there, all right? Second method would be to graph either the y equals a sine of bx or y equals a cosine of bx, just without any vertical or horizontal translation, the most basic part of that that we can find, um, with its appropriate amplitude and period, 2 pi over b again, graph that, and then use the translations, whether they're phase shifts, so horizontal transformations, um, or vertical transformations, use those phase shifts, that we found before. If C is positive, again, C being the one out front of that, C plus F of X, um, shift it up. C is negative, shift it down. If D is positive, again, meaning X minus D, so we have X minus two, shift to the right, D is negative to the left. All right. And again, we're taking all those, don't, don't try to shift it in any weird way. Just take the points that we know where find those maximum and minimums and intersection points, because those are the ones that we can find and are easy to look at, and then just move those points up or down, left or right, so that you know we don't have to find any points in between there where we're looking at square root of two over two or anything like that. All right, any questions? One example that uh, combines all these together. Let's say I want to graph y equals negative 1 plus 2 sine of 4x plus pi over two periods. So first thing I would do is what? Factor out the four. Yeah, I could factor out the four. So, in fact, before I do that, say what that would come out to. If I wanted to do that, just so that I could do a or a, sorry, a phase shift, uh, a horizontal translation there. If I factored out the four from both terms inside the sine term, I'm going to end up with four times, obviously just x, but it'd be x plus what? Yeah, pi over four. Exactly. Simple enough. I just want it to look like if I were to multiply the four back in, I want it to look like four X plus five. All right, so I end up, if I factor that B 
term out, which is always the one that we need to use to find the period, however we're going to do this, factor that B term out, have Y equals negative one plus two sine of four times X plus pi over four, all in parentheses. That tells me that I'm going to have a period of what for this particular function? It's going to be pi over 2 because it's 2 pi over 4. So it'll be a total length of pi over 2 when we find that. If I want to figure out exactly where we have a starting point and an ending point for that interval, um, and again, that's always in parentheses because it repeats itself infinitely. If I want to figure out where that starting and ending point are, I'm going to take that b times x minus d, so 4 times x plus pi over 4 here, put it between 0 and 2 pi. First thing to do there, the way it's written, divide everything by 4. So I'm going to have 0 less than or equal to and just x plus pi over 4, and then up to pi over 2. And this right there already tells us the length of the period. All right. Now that I've divided by that b term, I know zero to pi over two, that's the total length. Because all I'm gonna do from there is subtract pi over four, the exact same value from both or from both sides, from both of those endpoints. So the, the total length of it doesn't change at this point. It's always gonna have that length, I'm just shifting that a little bit. So if I subtract pi over four from everything then to solve for x, I get that this interval goes from negative pi over four to positive pi over four. But a length, again, as we expect of pi over 2, because it's 2 pi divided by 4, gives me pi over 2. And that's what this total length from negative pi over 4 to pi over 4 is going to be equal to. All right. No problem. Divide that up into four parts. So I'm going to have negative pi over 4, negative pi over 8, 0, pi over 8, pi over 4 relatively simple for that one. But the way to do that in general terms, if it's not, if it wasn't, let's say, even on both sides, like the same, same amount to the positive side as the negative side, which makes this a lot simpler to do, what I would do is take pi over two, or let me rephrase that. What I would do is take this interval, figure out whatever it is, we know it's pi over two, I'm gonna take pi over four, minus negative pi over four. I'm going to get the total length of that interval. And then I'm going to divide that by four, multiply it by one fourth. So I'm going to have pi over two is the total length. If I multiply that by one fourth, I get what? Pi over eight. So if I know that that's going to be the way I divide it up, the total length is pi over two, and I multiply that by one fourth, I get pi over eight. Now I'm going to just start at this left endpoint. I'm going to take negative pi over 4, add pi over 8 to that. Pi, negative pi over 4 plus pi over 8 is negative pi over 8. Add another pi over 8, I get to 0. Add another pi over 8, I get to pi over 8. And then add another one, I get to that right end. All right, so that's the, the process again. If it wasn't even on the negative and positive side, kind of like the very first example we had, um, that's the way to go about doing it. By the total length, divide it by 4, and just keep adding that exact same value, starting with the left endpoint. All right? Make a table, plug those in, find the Y values that go along with this. All right? So if I have those values, I'm gonna take X plus pi over four, it gives me zero, pi over eight, pi over four, and so on. And then when I multiply that by four, which again, the four times X plus pi over four is what's inside the sine function, when I multiply that by four, I get my quadrantal angles again. Zero pi over two, pi, three pi over two, and two pi. Take sine of each of those, multiply by two, and then take negative one plus that value. Again, just step by step to get to the y value for every given x value that we found. All right? And then just plot them. Looks like that. Add a little bit. If I start here and have one period, I can add another half period there, another half period to there, so that it stays kind of even on both sides. All right? 
as we would expect, that line where I have the intercepts is negative, y equals negative one, shifted downward by, by a unit. A little harder to, to kind of see any horizontal shift the way this is already moved, but we have, you know, moved stuff a little bit one way or the other. We have, we've compressed the period because B was four, stretched it out a little bit where the amplitude is two on either side of that line. All right, so that's combining all of them together. Makes sense. No problem. Again, if you want to stick with the same idea, finding, you know, finding the interval, divide it up into four parts, and just plug them in, it still works. If it works. Plug them in. You can find them that way. Easy to graph. All right. Um, we got ten minutes. I don't necessarily want to go through. If you want to go through this and kind of figure out you know what amplitude and stuff like this it's a little bit of graphing stuff um i kind of want to make an announcement here so yeah you can go through that if you'd like all right but that's the general gist of what we're talking about any questions on horizontal or vertical translations how they apply what to do with them all right um then the announcement that i would like to make is uh because of the all the stuff that was going on not last week but the week before with all the weather um there were some difficulties some people had with the test um i accommodated whoever let me know but there were still some some people who didn't weren't able to do that. And so I'm going to offer a retake on the first test. When I say retake, it's not going to be the same ones because I've already used all the problems from the test bank that I can use. So I'm still making that one. Um, it's going to look a little bit different, but the, the concepts on the test will still be the same. I, I can't take, I mean, we are, we already lost last Monday's class because of the stuff that happened here. And we're a little sure if I wanna keep one lesson per, per class period, um, we'll still fall a little short already. So I don't wanna take a class period to do it. So what I'm going to do is the retake, it's still gonna be on Blackboard, it's still gonna be the same process that you went through the first time with Proctorio, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I'm going to, let's say, since I'm just announcing it today, I want to have it like tomorrow or anything, but let's say Wednesday night between I'll, I'll open it and have it open between eight and 10 o'clock is the plan for now. If that time doesn't work, let me know before then, I, obviously I'm sure some people could be working or have other stuff to do at that point. But that's, that's at least an area where I think most people could do it. Um, so Wednesday, 8 to 10, will be a retake of the first test. It'll still be on Blackboard. I want to also emphasize as well, you don't have to retake it. If you're fine with the grade that you got, um, you, you don't have to take it again. If you want to just for practice, I guess that's okay. I'll take the highest grade either way whether it's the first one or the retake. Um, you don't have to retake it. So if you're fine with your grade and that time doesn't work for you, don't even sweat it, all right? Don't worry about it. Just, you know, you can live with that one, that's okay. If not, if you really struggled through it, I know there were a few people that told me they got lower grades than they were anticipating. So Wednesday night from eight to 10, I will I'll have a new test made up and I'll post that to Blackboard. Um, again, if that time just absolutely can't possibly work, then it won't be, it's not supposed to take two hours either. It's gonna be the same number of questions, it's gonna be the same thing. All right, um, so it shouldn't, it shouldn't even, probably won't even take as long as the first one, to be honest. Uh, but that is, that's the deal for now. 
let me know immediately if that's not going to work but that's the plan you will see it up here on wednesday night at eight o'clock you can retake the test i'll take the highest grade out of the two so if you got a really good grade but it wasn't 100 and you want to try for that 100 you can do that too you don't have to be afraid that it's going to to like lower the grade i'm not going to average them out i'm just going to take the higher one okay any questions on that Again, same format, same everything on Blackboard, same process. Hopefully we don't, hopefully there's not the, I, I know we had some difficulties. Some people had some difficulties making sure Proctorio worked with it. Um, this being the next time, I, I feel like it should be a little more straightforward and no one will have to email me like immediately and be like, I can't get it to work. It should be fine. Okay.